welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. I'm very excited to have a, one of my favorite authors here today, Robert Dagoni. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Now, I want to dive into, of course, to your new novel, which I read uh, probably over the last two days uh, in a frenzy to get to the end. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic novel, and I definitely want to talk about it. Uh, but I want to start, if we could, a little bit back further to the beginning of your career. So there comes up, I mean, obviously, you're, a, you're an attorney. Yeah. Um, then there comes a point in time when you become a reporter for the uh, LA Times. And then this opportunity to talk about environmental crime comes up, right? That that you write this book, uh, the Cyanide Canary. Can you talk a little bit about that? That the origins of your writing? Yeah, um, you know, I kind of went in circles a little bit. Uh, I come from a big family. I have nine brothers and sisters, and all my older brothers and sisters are professionals and and highly successful and. Um, I was I was a kid that loved to write. I loved to read and I loved to write. And I, I studied journalism in college and I worked for the LA Times and I kind of had every intention of becoming a journalist. And then I started working in Los Angeles and um, they w shipped me out to the San Gabriel Valley and I was uh, covering some, you know, very uh, stories out in Azusa and a lot of small towns out there. And I was, you know, 21 years old and wasn't making a lot of money. And I was wondering, well, you know, maybe I should uh, follow my siblings and and uh, look for something with a little stronger financial background. And I'd have a little bit more control over where I was going to live. You know, I wanted to live in the Bay Area at the time with, with my family. Um, and so, you know, quite honestly, I kind of chickened out and um, I went to law school. I went to UCLA and I became a lawyer, but I became, it became very apparent pretty early on um, that I did not want to be a lawyer, lawyer forever, that I really missed writing and uh, stories and I wanted to get back into it. So, um, you know, with the help of my wife who, um, you know, was very gracious and uh, very supportive, um, I told her, I said, you know, I want to, I want to give it another shot. And uh, in, I think it was 1999, um, I made that decision and um, we moved to Seattle where she's from, her home, because we had an opportunity to live in her wife's grand grandmother's, her in her grandmother's home. Um, and which would of course be a huge savings in terms of money and all those things. And I could give myself a shot and that's what we did. And um, it only took uh, <laughs> five years, I think, to get that first book published and about 15 years before I could walk away from the law completely uh, and say I'm a full-time writer. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a long road. I'll say that. Well, yeah, I, it certainly, it certainly seems that way. I, I think the jury master was probably the first book of yours that I read. Um, so that's a pretty much back to the first few books. I want to say that's early on. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't, I enjoyed that. And then I stumbled upon a few years later, um, the Tracy Crosswhite series, right. right? And that's, I think, what hooked me for you, right? I do love, she's a, a chemistry teacher turned, you know, police officer, really. <laughs> All right. And uh, I think her storyline, the series uh that you've written for her is really what drew me to you first. It's so well written and it's compelling and um, it just leaves you wanting more. Um, and that was the first experience I had. So tell me why, because I think it's unusual for a, a male author to write a female hero. Um, so what, what drew you to that? Well, uh, necessity is the first thing. Um, I had written the David Sloan series, which was a, um, a series involving a legal thrillers, basically, uh, a little bit different than your traditional legal thrillers in that they weren't necessarily courtroom drama type stuff. Um, and, you know, the fifth book came out and a lot of things happened at the publisher I was with. And, you know, I don't, won't get into details, but basically they said, we don't want any more Davis Sloan books. Um, we like you, but we don't want any more Davis Sloan books. Um, 
And so my agent came to me and said, you know, onward and upward, you need to, you need to create a new character. And um, I went back through the old David Sloan books and I was kind of looking at, you know, some, maybe some spinoff characters and, and I came up with the, um, came up with the, in the, in one of the books, I think it was Murder One, uh, two homicide detectives. One was Tracy Crosswhite and the other was Kensington Row. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, I knew that police procedural sold well. And I thought, you know, um, if I'm going to do this, this might be a way to do it. And so I called up my agent and I said, I said, Kensington Row. And I explained it to her and she said, let me get back to you. And she got back to me and she said, no. She said, who is Tracy Crosswhite? I mean, who is this person? How does she go from being a chemistry teacher to being a police officer? And, you know, what well, the funny thing is, is I didn't know. Uh, and here I had created the character. Um, and so I started to do some exploration about, you know, who Tracy Crosswhite was. And, you know, it's, it's really ironic the way things happen. Um, I rely a lot on help. And uh, I was put in touch with a King County Sheriff, homicide sheriff, um, named Scott Thompson. And, and I went to Scott and I said, you know, here's what I want to do. And I started telling him, I, I said, I want to write about a female homicide detective, but I want to get it right. You know, do you, and at the time, you know, there was, I think, one female homicide detective in all of Seattle. Uh, and, um, and I'm telling him this and he's looking at me kind of funny. And I, I get done and he looks at me and he goes, you ought to meet my girlfriend. And I said, oh, and he said, yeah, he said, Jennifer is Seattle's first female homicide detective, and she's practically identical to the person you just described. And I said, well, you think she'd meet with me? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So here I went and I met uh, Jennifer Crosswhite, uh, and I, not, not Jennifer Crosswhite, Jennifer Southworth, and um, wonderful person. And I mean, it was just, it was almost eerie that I'm meeting this person and the similarities to the character I had created in my mind. And so, um, you know, I relied heavily on Jen's experience as a, as a homicide detective. She came up through the ranks, you know, she was a police officer. Uh, she's a really good shooter, um, always kind of was at the top of the class, uh, became a detective, went into CSI. I mean, all the things that sort of Tracy Crosswhite's background came from, Je from Jen. And, um, you know, I always say to people, I don't try to write from the perspective of a woman. Um, just like in the Charles Jenkins series, I didn't try to write from the perspective of an African-American man. I try to write from the perspective of a human being, uh, a person who has skeletons in her closet that has caused her a great amount of angst and pain that she's trying to get past, which, you know, which is a, a universal trait that male or female doesn't matter. Race doesn't matter. Those are universal traits. And, and that's really what I wanted to focus on. Now, I do have four older sisters that are all professionals. Uh, I worked in a career with a lot of very highly competent professional women. And so I had an opportunity to, to experience all that and to bring that all into this character of Jennifer Southworth. But really, I just wanted to, to write about a homicide detective. And, you know, ironically, she was very appreciative of that because she always said to me, she didn't want to be treated as a female homicide detective. She just wanted to be treated as a homicide detective. Um, and so I always tried to do that in the Tracy Crosswhite series is, you know, she's just a detective. Yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty, pretty hooked from the very first, uh, her very first novel, you know, where you, her standalone, certainly. I don't think I realized she came from one of the prior novels, to be honest with you. I, I started from her first book. I don't. I didn't realize you had grabbed her from another, yeah. uh, from another series before that. Uh, but so I think, I think I was so hooked by your very first novel for her that I just kept following her. Right. I was very. I was just interested, and in, and in, and the stories are so tightly written. They're so well laid out with clues and. Uh, I, I mean, I just can't say enough. I mean, if you're looking for a good mystery you i think you're the guy right i mean because you really lay things out like breadcrumbs and always a it's always just a, a exciting read uh and then that because i was so hooked on tracy i think i followed you to charles jenkins that like cia 
uh, vibe, right? And I followed, I followed you over to him and his stories as well. Equally as exciting. I mean, these are some of the best books, you know, bestsellers. Um, but I have to know, what does it feel like the first time you get a New York Times, you know, you hit the bestseller list and like they write a positive review. What, I mean, what are you, what are you doing when you hear that news? I mean, are you dancing around like Tom Cruise in your underwear? Like what, what's, what's that moment look like? <laughs> I'm not a very good dancer. I don't think anyone would want to see me in my underwear, but um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an acknowledgement. It is a, a, um, uh, it's it's something that says you know you're you're not screwing up too badly um that you must be doing something right um you know ironically it's really the the emails that i'll get from readers that are really almost mean more to me um because those are such so much they're they're personal you know when someone emails me and says uh talks to me about you know what a book meant to them you know the extraordinary life of sam hell and, and how that brought them to tears and laughter and all those things. Or they write me and they say, you know, oh my God, I was on the edge of my seat and I finished the last Tracy Crossway book at 3 a.m. Um, you know, that's just, that, that's just exciting because um, we all know there are haters in the world, um, you know, and uh, you're gonna get your share of those, uh, those types of, of reviews and things like that. Um, and so it's nice when, when nice people, good people will write to tell you how much they enjoyed something that you wrote. Um, you know, it's a ju justification. Like I said, it's, it's yeah, that you're doing something correct that, you know, you're, you're moving people. Um, because, you know, we write here in this office and it's just me and the computer and these characters in my head and I'll get done with a book and, and I'll always have a, a pretty good feeling that it's a good book. You know, I feel like, yeah, this is a good book. I like this. But there's still that that little bit of hesitation in the back of your mind that you miss something, that your editors miss something, that there's some gaping hole, you know, that someone's going to drive a truck through. Um, and, and then so when when the book comes out and, and people people, you know, email you to say they enjoyed it, it, it means a lot. It really does. Well, that brings up an interesting question. What is your creative process like? Like I've interviewed authors who say, uh, you know, for me, I've got to be at the computer and these characters are in my head and they just tell me, they they take me on the journey. They tell me what happens next. And I've had authors tell me, you know, I need to plan it all out. You know, I need to sit, I create all my characters ahead of time. I know exactly where we're going. I know exactly what the end will be. Uh, whether or not they deviate as they go a little bit, uh, you know, is a secondary matter. But for the most part, everything is pre-planned. Yeah. Uh, but what does the process look like for you? Well, it's changed uh, over the years. I, you know, I used to outline uh, at least a portion of the book. And, and that's partly because when you're starting out, uh, your editor wants to know what you're going to be writing about. You know, they don't, they don't have that built-in trust yet that you're going to be able to put, pull something off. Um, and I invariably I'd put together an outline and by the third page, I'd be off the outline. Uh, and, you know, this was just sort of a, a, a process for me that was really difficult because I'd spend a lot of time doing this outlining and then it, I wouldn't use it. And that just, to me, that just wasted time. Um, and then, you know, the short of a long story was um, when I, when I was let go by my publisher who did the David Sloan books, I had some time on my hands while I was trying to create, come up with a new character. And, and I read Stephen King's book on writing. And he talked about, you know, how does a writer sitting at his desk touch the heart and soul of a person he's never met, living in a town he's never visited and never will. And he talked about telepathy. You know, it's, it's by telepathy. And of course, you know, you, that's Stephen King's way of saying it. And you're like, okay, that's, uh, that's a bit odd. Uh, I'm not really sure how that works. But what it did is it reminded me of an experience I had at a writer's conference where I was on a panel with Diana Gabaldon, um, who wrote the Outlander series. And Diana called it magic. She was asked the question and Diana said, um, she goes into her office at night and she lights a candle and she waits until her characters feel comfortable to come into the room and start speaking to her. And it's like a kaleidoscope, you know, whatever the, you know, the bunch of colors are flashing at her and, and she'll see a word and she just starts typing. And so, you know, over the course of, of uh, really started with the first Tracy Crosswhite book, My Sister's Grave, and, and then it, 
I really experienced it fully when I wrote uh, The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell, where I did try to just put myself in a place where I could relax and not be anxious, not have anxiety. And this comes from, you know, a lot of study of story structure and how books are put together and how plots are put together. And also from some experience. Um, and, you know, I teach and, and that's what I tell my students, you know, don't think that this is just going to happen overnight. But my point is that once you feel comfortable with how a story is told, then you just have to let your characters tell you that story and be confident that the story is going to have an ending and the ending, the ending is going to work. Um, and it's really a beautiful process. It really is. Um, it's hard to explain, but there are times when I'm writing the book where I'm literally like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, you know, when I wrote The World Played Chess and there's a scene that comes up toward the end and I was, you know, I was in, I, I was in tears as I'm writing the scene because I never saw it coming. And yet it was plainly obvious that I had to write the scene and I didn't want to do it because uh, it meant losing a character that I had really come to like and enjoy. Um, so for me, it's a process of exploration. It's a, it's a process of discovery. Um, and really, it, it's a process where you just have to be comfortable and you have to say to yourself, um, my characters are going to tell me a story and I need to let them tell me that story. Uh, and that, that's how it is for me anyway. And I know, as you said, there's a lot of different types of processes, but that's my process now is, is I let these characters tell me the story. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really love that. Um, Matthew Dix, the writer, you know, was telling me once uh, an interesting anecdote where he said, you know, my, my wife called me in the middle of writing a book. I answered the phone. He said, and and he said, you know, I, I can't talk like I'm in the middle of, let's say, whoever's about to, he's climbing the stairs. And she said, well, what are you going to do? Like, is he going to, is he going to still survive or not? And he goes, I, I don't know. Like, I, I haven't, like, he hasn't told me yet. Like, yeah. I got to go. Like, yeah. you know, that's how much, like, the characters, like, he had to get back to the community because he didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. He wanted to go back and be there. And I do think, you know, writing like that is very isolating, right? Novels, it's not quite the same as writing a script because it's very collaborative. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you write the script and then there's, uh, you know, there's, there may be editors, certainly, but even when you get the script to the final form, there's paper version of a character. And then there's, you know, the, the character, the actor who plays it, who pull, you know, pulls the person, you know, off the page, the paper character becomes live paper character with their quirks and everything. Uh, and then you, you'll have the director and the cinematographer who visually weave you through a story. So that by the time you watch that movie or that TV show, there's been so many hands in the, in that product. It's just very collaborative. Right. But 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 writing a novel isn't like that, right? It's kind of isolating. You're on your own. Uh, it's you and these characters, and you're like, yeah, like let's get together and tell the story. Um, so I, I really admire, you know, the writers who can do that, who can just, you know, be in a room alone and and have the story kind of flow through them onto the page. Yeah, it's funny. I never feel alone. Um, you know, my kids are, characters grown. are hanging out with you. <laughs> yeah, my kids are grown and they're out of the house. Um, my wife works outside the house and, um, but I, I'm here and I just, I never feel alone. Um, and I think like you said, that a large part of that is, you know, my characters are here with me and I'm putting, when I'm putting the book together. Um, now that's not to say that there are moments where I'm like, okay, I've got to get out of the house, <laughs> you know, and I, and I will, um, but I know I'm never lonely. Uh, I, I really I can't, can honestly say I'm I'm not lonely when I'm writing my in fact it's I, there are days where I can't wait to get to the computer uh, and, and get back to all the characters. I'm, I'm thinking that that's your passion coming through um, then when you write and then and that's what's jumping off the page. Um, so I mean I have to take you into the new novel right um, her deadly game uh, I read it across, I would have read it in one sitting, honestly, if I hadn't been so tired from my day already mm -hmm. that I conked out, uh, you know, I would have probably made it all the way through. Uh, it's, it's, wow, it's a really compelling read. Uh, I know it's a standalone novel, but I'm kind of hoping you give that a second thought and maybe give Kira her own series. Uh, She's going to get her own series. Um <laughs> Yeah, the book's done. I was hoping the, the, so. The family is interesting and the, and the character is just an amazing character. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, she's going to have her own series. Um, 
I always kind of thought that, um, you know, basically my, my editor, who's a, just a terrific editor and a terrific person, uh, Gracie Doyle came to me and said, you know, we, we'd like you to write another legal thriller. And we discussed it, the two of us. And I said, you know, I, I, I'll write a legal thriller, but I want it to be my style. I don't want to write John Grisham style. I don't want to write Scott Turow's style. I want to write Bob Degoni style. And, and that meant I wanted to write a female character um, because I think it's more interesting. Uh, I want to have family dynamics. I want to have police procedural and I want to have courtroom drama. And I wanted to have all three, and that's sort of that's sort of my style, where I where where my legal thrillers lay. They match life, right? Because in life, it, this there's a lot of different you know balls in the air at the same time, right? There's a lot of different components going on. There's never just one thing. Right. Even I'm an attorney myself, right? There's, there's you're never in a courtroom where it, it's that's the only place you've been. Your journey to be effective in a courtroom um, has taken you through, you know, a, a lot of documents, a lot of witnesses, and to even to just to rise to that moment. Right, it's, right. So no, I, absolutely. I agree, and and I agree with that. You know, I remember, you know, I, I, I never got to try a lot of cases when I was practicing, um, but I, I did have some. But I remember taking a lot of depositions. I remember one deposition where, as this guy was asking questions, he was literally gluing pieces together, building a small car. And at a break, I said, what the hell are you doing? And he said, my son's got a soapbox derby tomorrow and I forgot to, I forgot to get the car for him. So he's, you know, he's taking this deposition and he's asking <laughs> questions. This guy was a really experienced lawyer and he's just, he's asking these questions where he's, you can tell he's just ripping this guy up, but in the interim, he's putting wheels on. And, and you know, that's when I think I was single at the time and I was young and you realize that it is. And lawyers, you know, lawyers aren't just lawyers. They're not just courtroom. They they have spouses, partners, you know, children, uh, friends, uh, parents uh, that are aging and there's problems going on and there, there's all these things outside of it. And that's what I wanted for Kira is I wanted to talk about the family dynamics and, and you know, uh, what it's like to be, you know, have two older sisters that are, are mothering her and and a, and a father who's a, a chronic alcoholic, um, you know, all those all those things that that I've experienced in my life, um, and uh, you know, I've I, through you know my my parents and my grandfather. My grandfather was a very successful uh, dentist, but he was also an alcoholic, and I saw what that did to my mother. And um, I know what is I, I know a lot more about my mom now as she's gotten older. She's ninety years old. Um, it's uh, it's it's. I, I just I just thought it would make for a rich tapestry um, and I didn't want to exploit any of it I didn't want to exploit anything in particular but I wanted it to be honest and, and raw and um, and that's what I tried to do with Kira oh you absolutely capture that um, and that's one of the things I loved about it. I mean, the, it is raw and real are probably the two of the best words you can think of. Uh, but it, it's also got a little bit for everybody, right? There, there. You drop some clues along the way, but not enough, <laughs> like not quite enough, really, to figure it out, right? I mean, you, you, you're. I will say that by the time I got to the end, where I sort of collide with you, you know, where I sort of get to the point like, oh my goodness, this is what's about to happen. Like by the time I get to the end walking with you in this journey, I was sort of stunned, right? I sort of had to sit there for a minute and go, wow. Uh, I mean, that's how good the ending is. And I mean, and I, I read a lot. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to surprise me. And I, I read, I read a lot of this type of novel as well. Uh, but I, I just felt you, you just laid it. I mean, the pace is perfect. The, the, the clues are just enough to draw or are somewhat maddening, right? Because it's just enough. I mean, you're, you were following breadcrumbs, but it's not enough to be obvious. And uh, wow, it's just really good. The courtroom scenes, you nail the family dynamics, you nail, <laughs> right? It's, it's just, it's that, the family. I mean, they all have their problems with each other, but probably come together when they need to, despite their shortcomings. Um, it just, it's really, it's really well done. It's compelling. It's fast. It's a fast read. It's, it's not being, it's not a short book, but a fast read. 
Yeah, thank you. I always, I always say my litmus test for a good book is irresistibility, right? It has to be irresistible to me. I have to start it and it's too irresistible for me to put down, right? And, the, and, and you definitely rang that bell for me. It was too irresistible to put down. Like I wanted, if I hadn't been exhausted and nodded off, I would have done the whole thing straight through. Wow, thank it's really you. really good. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, 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 I spend a lot of time editing um and i have some very good editors that i that i rely on and that i trust and um you know you talked about the collaborative process of screenwriting and i think a good novelist has to let people do their jobs and i have some some really good editors and i always i always tell you know students and when i'm when i teach i'll always i'll actually show them i'll show them a, a you know a five pages that I've gotten from my developmental editor. And the first page is just how great the book is and how great I am and how great everything is. And then you turn it over and the next four single type page, single space pages are everything that needs to be done to fix the book. And you know, that's hard. It's hard to get it and read it because you thought you've turned in a complete book and you, you always think to yourself, oh, that book's perfect. And then you get somebody that's th that's doing her job for me, and and I've been with uh, same development editor on thirteen books now, and and I trust her. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't read the 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 pages and initially throw them, and say you know this is bullshit and walk away and think ah, and then I come back and I look at it and I go she's right, and she it definitely makes the book better. So um, I try to I try to edit out as much as the unnecessary as possible um, because I want my books to be a fast read. Uh, my books, when I turn them in, uh, they might be 420 typewritten pages, you know, computer pages, whatever. And by the time I'm done, it's always 400. I mean, in invariably. Now, the literary novels, they're traditionally longer and stuff like that. But the, the, the genre fiction, I mean, I'll, it'll be 430 pages and, and I'll turn it in and my thought will be, there's 30 pages too much here. And I, I know Charlotte's going to tell me what to cut and what, and, and so it gets down to about 400 and it's a lot of dialogue um, because I think dialogue is interesting. Um, and I think that comes from practicing law and taking depositions and trial. I mean, it's, it's the dialogue that's the interesting part for me anyway, um, not the narrative. Agreed. Now, are you into, are you into literature? I have to ask, you know, the importance of being earnest, Oscar Wilde, right? It plays, I'll never look, which I'll never look at it the same again. <laughs> You've all but ruined it for me, but, <laughs> uh, but tell me, are you, were you, uh, was that chosen because you have a, a particular attachment to that or just, happenstance that it fit your story no I, a couple of things one is um my mother before she started having 10 kids uh was an english teacher and um i used to get in trouble in grammar school and again the short of a long story was um, they started handing me books to read my mother started handing me books to read to kind of keep me you know occupied and and i was reading books like the count of monte cristo and the old man in the sea and the red badge of courage and of mice and men and uh um, Lord of the Flies and you know all, all of these books you know I was 12 years old 13 years old um, and I found that's where I kind of fell in love with story and as I got older I read a lot of uh, John Irving you know Prayer for and Meany and and um, um, not, I read some Cormac McCarthy but um, Larry McMurtry um, and um, gosh he's south of the guy that wrote South Abroad and um, I'm drawing a blank but anyway, you know, I love I love to read that. I love to read about lives lived um, and things like that. Um, and then I also I was a I was a performer. I did I did a lot of theater when I was practicing law. I think I was really craving the arts. Um, I was in some really hard nosed litigation, and it became an outlet for me, a, a, a chance to perform. And I did a lot of plays in San Francisco. And um, a friend of mine was in uh, the uh, importance of being earnest. And um, I went to see him uh, in, in a show that he did. And so I knew the play and I knew what the play was about. And so when I was writing the story and, and, uh, and the characters, um, 
I, 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 kn I knew that that, that play would be um, something that would, that would fit comfortably within what I was trying to do. The one thing that I did have concerns about, and I'll be honest with, is um, I had some concerns that um, the, reader would, the reader would not necessarily go along with it. Um, that this person had, you know, this person knew this book, knew this story. Um, and so I just had to trust again. And, and, and I think there is a relationship between readers and writers of trust. Um, if I write a book that's raw and honest and unfiltered, I have to trust that my my reader will read it that way and accept it that way. Because let's be honest, right? In, in every book that's written, fiction, in, in every novel that's written, um, there is a coincidence, right? That's how a novel starts. It starts with a coincidence. And, uh, and you have to trust that your reader will say, okay, uh, this is a coincidence, however... I know that this, this is part of the story and it's not the story. Um, and most readers that are discerning, you know, like yourself uh, who reads a lot, readers that are discerning will give an author that, that leeway and say, okay, uh, you know, everything's sort of starting to come together. That's not how, you know, as you know, that's not how real trials work. Um, but they'll, they'll go with you because they trust you because you've written a book that's honest. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree with that. You know, and, and I and I actually obviously I had read the play, so I was familiar with it before reading your book. But I think even if I hadn't been, um, you accomplished two things. You would have made me curious about it. So I would have, as soon as I completed your book, picked picked up the play and read the play. Uh, so you would have made me curious enough to have opened me up to uh, another piece of, of just great writing, uh, Oscar Wilde. I mean, it's, it, it, what can you say? I mean, certainly no compliment I can I can give the work uh, would do it justice anyway. Um, so I, I think that's important in and of itself. I really like when my books do that, when I'm reading a book and it opens me up to uh, a new a new world. Or I, I really do enjoy when someone grabs an old piece of literature and somehow works it in yeah. uh, somehow into into a story. And I think that's a great thing for for readers, especially if you have young readers who maybe aren't as well read. I mean, a lot of kids don't like to read when they're young, and then maybe it comes to them later on, uh, and they get this opportunity to go back and revisit things. Uh, so I, I think that's important. I think I think instilling curiosity is important, and and you definitely do that. If I hadn't been familiar, I would have been very curious about the play. Yeah, I, I and that's I think that's really what art is about, right? Art is about um, people, different people reading, you know, your work, and each of them coming away with their own experience, uh, and that experience might be to go pick up the importance of being earnest and reading it, or it might be you know, to go pick up other prior books that I've written and, and, and see what the relationships to them. But I, I think that's, that's the beauty of it is I love getting emails from people that will tell me, you know, um, their personal experience that they brought to the story, um, because that's what we all do. Um, and I always am encouraging, you know, new writers, uh, students, for instance, I'll, I'll encourage them to not be afraid to leave white space on the page to allow the reader to imagine. Um, I think too often, if 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 a writer makes mistakes, myself included, it's over describing something, over over explaining something. And when you do that, when you over describe something, then you you remove that white space and and you remove the reader's ability to imagine it for themselves. And I can never write as well as you can imagine. I just can't. I mean, that's impossible. Right. Uh, and so I have to, I have to, I have to allow you that, afford you that luxury that you have, that creativity that you possess to, to imagine what my characters look like and, and what they're feeling and, and not, not over describe it so that I take that experience away from you. Well, this is a great episode of Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know if you're familiar with the sitcom. I have watched every episode of Everybody Loves Raymond probably five times. <laughs> right. So, so Deborah wants to get it's the one with the with the she builds the little jewelry box and he makes fun of it at the auction and she says she's going to get back at him, and then ultimately she doesn't do 
anything, but he runs up in his mind every place he sees the revenge scheme everywhere yeah. he looks. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so that's kind of exactly what you're saying, right? And she says to him in the end, nothing I could have come up with would have been as bad as what your mind could have imagined for you. Yeah. And that was the punch at the end. Yeah. No, I, I remember I remember the episode uh, explicitly. And yeah, and you're right. That is kind of what I'm saying is um, that's that's the pleasure in it for the reader. And and. It's the difference between books and movies. Um, books are interactive. You immerse yourself in the story and you become part of the story. You're there. Uh, movies just sort of come at you and you take them in. Um, that's, there's a, there's a, it's a different medium. Um, and I think that's the beauty of reading and that's the beauty of books. Um, my son turned me on to this author and, uh, you know, uh, he's really brilliant about immersing you in the character's world so that you feel a part of it. You feel like you're there. Um, you, I can see it. And, and uh, I, I, just for kicks, I did a uh, whisper sync where I, I, cause I was on a, you know, 14 hour plane ride home from, from Doha, uh, Alaska, uh, from Africa to Doha and home, you know, 20 hours, 28 hours, something like that. And so I, I, I put on the audio and I was about 30 pages into the story that my son had told me to read. And then I started syncing it and I was reading it as I was listening to it. And um, it was a totally different experience because characters' names were pronounced differently. Suddenly my character had a voice that I hadn't imagined the voice would be like. Uh, other characters had voices I hadn't imagined them to be exactly what I had already experienced for myself. And I was just, uh, really, I was on the plane. It was, again, the process of discovery for me. It was like, okay, this is a different experience. This isn't what I had imagined. Um, it wasn't, didn't make it any worse. It just was different. Um, but sometimes it does. I mean, we've all seen them. We've all seen movies made all, based off of books. And you're like, wow, they ruined the book. Yeah. Like they did not do the book justice. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, that I deal with is, um, you know, I have I had some books I, that are in production and there's things like that. And, you know, you just have to keep your fingers crossed that you put it in the right hands of the right people and, and they will, they will be true to your story. Um, that doesn't always happen. So that had to be exciting though, right? To, the fir first time you get a call that a uh, producer wants to option your book, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it, it's. I think it's exciting initially uh, because that imagination starts to go, right? Oh my God, they're going to make a film and this can be, and, and I think everybody sees that as the be all end all is, you know, they're going to turn your book into a film and it's going to win an Academy Award and they, you're going to get to go to the Academy Awards and, you know, you, you just, your mind starts going on and on all these, and then you got to pull it back uh, because it's really a long involved process. And then they start coming to you with suggestions uh, about changing things. And you begin to realize that it's not really your story anymore. It's now their story. And probably the best piece of advice I got from a friend of mine that's, that was in the film business for a very long time. And, um, you know, he, he talked about, they'll always ask you, would you be interested in writing the screenplay? And the answer should always be no, because it's no longer my story. It's the, it's your story. It's the screenwriter's story. And that's going to be a different story than the story that I told. Um, there's a famous story out there. John Irving wrote the screenplay to um, the Cider House Rules, and he won an Academy Award for it. And if the story is to, true, he initially wrote the story and the producers or the, you know, the producers said, this is great, John. It's exactly like the book. Now, I want you to throw that out, throw the book out, and just write me the story again. Because it's a different story. It's a different medium. Um, and he did. And, you know, obviously, he's a very talented man. Um, and so, you know, that, uh, that was really good advice for me, because that's not what I do well. Uh, what I do well is write stories, that, and that's where my that's where I need to focus. Um, it's like practicing law, you know. If you are a... Uh, you know, you're a lawyer that specializes in medical malpractice and somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I have this personal injury case. 
Could you take it? Probably. But would the person be better off with someone that specializes in it? Probably. So I think we all have to learn our lanes, what we're good at, what we're not good at, you know, and, and I'm going to try to stick to my lane. And, you know, at 62 years of age, that whole fantasy magic about, oh, it's Hollywood, that's really gone for me now. Um, it's just, I, you know, if it happens, terrific. But this is what I do. I, I write. And that's, and that's where I try to focus. Well, you certainly do a good job of, of this. <laughs> I, you know, again, I've, I've been a long time fan. So I've, I followed, you. you know, so many of your books, as I say, I, I switched over to the nook right years ago. I have a, I have a few of your books around here that are the hardcover, you know, books initially. Uh, and then I got to the point where I went to the nook. So I'm one of those digital readers now. Some people you can't even say that to. They're all like, no, no, you got to have the book in your hand. Uh, but I got to a point where it was just easier to carry my nook places. So I always had it with me. It was thin. It was mobile. And I could get a book at three o'clock in the morning if I was awake and needed to. <laughs> I just needed something new to read. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely transferred over to, to digital books. But my 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 nook is littered with your with your, your books. So thank you. Um, so I was excited to read the new one, and then when I realized this was okay, this is this is these are a set of new people. I haven't seen them before, uh, and I start getting through it, and I said, you know. I saw that it was that it's supposed to be a standalone. I was like, gee, I hope Kira's coming back. I really liked this character. I thought you did such a good job with her. Yeah, I'm I'm uh I have another Tracy book coming out October, which will be oh. number, number 10 in the series. And and it's it's I always try to do something in a book that's going to keep me interested. And what I wanted to do with the Tracy book is within the series, I wanted to have a mini series. And so this book coming out, um, One Last Kill. Is, uh, is the third book basically in the mini series. You know, it started with what she found. It started with a short story, actually, The Last Stand, and then what she found, and now la One Last Kill. And th that'll sort of wrap up the mini series within, and then I'll continue on with Tracy with a whole new different thing. Um, and then uh, I'm in the process of, I have, uh, I have two historical novels coming out. One is a legal thriller, uh, called The Killing on the Hill, it takes place in 1933. So Prohibition, mm -hmm. the Great Depression, uh, Seattle in the 1930s, incredibly corrupt. Um, it's about a reporter who gets this case of a killing in, the, in a, uh, a speakeasy. And it's a true story. Um, my wife's grandfather was the attorney for the guy accused of the murder. Wow. Now I fictionalized it, but I have, I have you know, newspaper clippings because he kept all of them. Uh, and I, it's just, it, the, the killing took place in the Pom Pom nightclub on Profanity Hill. If that doesn't beg for a story to be told, I don't know what does. Nothing uh, does then. No. So there's that. And then there's a 1947 World War II story, again, based on historical uh, truth. These two guys had done a tremendous amount of research and I agreed to write the book. Um, and that'll be coming out uh, but I'm in the process of writing Kira, the next Kira. And I have this, what I think is a really good idea that I'm just sort of starting to piece through. And it's a little bit of a psychological thriller, his, uh, legal thriller, um, where you're just not quite certain about the person she's defending because there's a history there. And I'm trying to do sort of like the Oscar Wilde thing where I'm just sort of trying to give the reader some clues, you know, and lead them down this path. Um, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be really fun to write. I'm about a hundred pages into it, but I keep getting pulled off. Um, you know, I had went to, I, I had a long time trip that got um, canceled by COVID to go to Africa with my wife and my, and my family. And so we just got back from that. and. I have the edits that I need to do on the historical novels, but I got to get back to Kira, that, that second Kira book. And I'm really anxious to see what's going to happen. Now, tell readers where, I mean, they can pretty much find your books anywhere. Uh, I mean, everywhere you buy a book, you can find your books. Uh, but uh, where can they learn more about you? So, you know, Amazon.com has a, a, a page for me, a bio page for me. I think it's... Um, I think it's uh, Robert Dagoni Books. Uh, my own website, um, 
uh, robertdegonibooks.com, um, which I have a daughter graduating from college who's really good at social media stuff, and and she's been doing some work for me, and she's been, she's you know she's got job offers for a real job, but she's telling me she'll stay doing this stuff. She's trying to update uh, my webpage to have more what's going on type things. Um, those are probably the two best sources uh, about kind of what's going on. And if you go to my webpage, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for. I don't spam people. Um, I don't have time to spam people. Uh, I don't know how some writers do it. You know, I'm lucky if I can get out two or three books a, a year, I mean, two or three book newsletters a year saying this is happening or this book is coming out. Um, those are really the best places. And, and social media, I'm on Facebook, you know, um, and uh, in, I guess I'm on Instagram now, thanks to my daughter, and I'm on TikTok, thanks to my daughter, you know. <laughs> um, that's, that's just not stuff that, that I'm, you know, I'm built for. I'm, I'm, I'm too old, you know. Uh, that stuff is all beyond me. And you got to hang out with your characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm that guy where I'll say to my daughter, hey, how do I do this on my phone? And she takes the phone from me. I'm like, okay, you're not helping me. You know, I'm going to have to ask you again. Show me what you're doing. You know, I get it. So, I mean, I hope that you will come back. I, and you know what I'd love to do when the new Tracy novel comes out? If you, I'd love to have you back oh, and talk about the it, new novel. Any, um, anytime, anytime. I, this is all, this is a thrill for me. You know, I tell people this all the time. Someone calls you up and says, we'd like to talk to you about what you do for a living. I mean, honestly, that's very humbling. So I will come back anytime. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I Again, I'm a huge fan. I appreciate it getting to spend some time with you. And I look forward to having you back. I, I look forward to being back. Thanks so much for having me. And, and, and thanks for being a fan. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. The podcast.